Raquel. Raquel's many of, uh, one of many that are headed to Fine Arts this coming Saturday, and uh, so we appreciate them willing to put forth their talent here and uh, worship the Lord. Would you please stand with me this morning? We read from the Word of the Lord. We'll be reading from Proverbs chapter 18, verses 20 and 21. Again, I want to welcome you. Proverbs 18, 20 and 21 says, a man's stomach shall be satisfied, satisfied from the fruit of his mouth. From the produce of his lips he shall be filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. You know, the next verse is a really good one, too. It says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. And my wife is not in here this morning. She's in Beginner's Church. And I have found extreme favor with the Lord in that catch there. So you... And that's our secret. Don't, don't tell her that, okay? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Let's go before the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, we thank you for your word. And, uh, Lord, we just ask that you would be lifted up and glorified in our lives. I thank you for all the youth that have uh, sacrificed of their time and their talent. And we just ask for your blessings upon them as they head to uh, fine arts. And we just ask for your presence in this place to continue to dwell and continue to guide and direct us. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and smile at somebody as you have a seat this morning. You know, we've all probably heard the lines, uh, or the line, sticks and stones may break my bones, but what? Words will never hurt me. That is such a big, fat lie, isn't it? Yeah, words can be the most stinging thing that we, can, um, that we can encounter. And, you know, truth is that words can hurt. Now, I'm not talking about silly stuff like when somebody sneezes and somebody else says, God bless you, and then that person gets offended, and they're like, I'm going to sue you now because you said, God bless you. We're not talking about politically correct stuff here, all right? We're talking about um, being, uh, uh, what we're talking about today is taming the tongue. That thing that's inside of our heads that can really get us into trouble at times. Amen? I know mine has, and I'm sure that each, if we're all honest in this place, at one time or another, we have said stuff that were just, just wasn't right. Uh, it may have been stinging or hurtful. Um, so we're going to talk about taming our tongue and being gracious with our words and speaking life as we should. You ever given a dog peanut butter? It's a lot of fun to watch a dog eat peanut butter. That joker will sit there. He won't bark, but he was, you know, his tongue is going against get that roof of his mouth, and he will sit there and lick that peanut butter until it is completely gone, will he not? And then even, even some more. So they, they don't bark. They're real quiet. They sit there and lick that, and, and I hope that we learn the art of knowing when to speak and when to kind of maybe stick some peanut butter in our mouths. Now, if you're allergic to peanut butter, then don't do that. Maybe you want to play Chubby Bunny. Just stick those marshmallows. Anybody here ever played Chubby Bunny before? I think, yeah, what a great game, huh? Sticking marshmallows in your mouth to the point where you just... It's a lot of fun. It's actually kind of fun to watch other people do it. <laughs> Today we're going to be covering three areas. Number one is going to be created in the image of God. Two called to speak as he speaks, and number three, tame that tongue. So let's dive right in this morning to our point number one, created in the image of God. Now, before we get into the power of the tongue, we need to understand um, who we've been made like. You are not an accident. You are here on purpose. Amen. Genesis 1, 26 through 28 says, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created him, them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and sub subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. You know, there was uh, some scientists that come up with this crazy machine. I think it was something like the human Makinator. And it had all kinds of dials and, and buttons, and they had decided they could make man. So they challenged God to a duel. They were like, God, we want to challenge you in a man-making contest. And God was like, okay. So they got there. They rolled their machine out, plugged it all up, and, and they started to go over to get some dirt. And God said, oh, no, make your own dirt. So... 
we've been created in the image of God. God created every single one of us. You're not an accident. You're here on purpose. You were born for such a time as this. You're here on purpose. And um, you, we, we need to understand that when it comes to the creation account, we have to create. We either have to trust Genesis chapter 1 or throw the whole thing out. And when I say the whole thing, I'm talking about the whole Bible. If you can't trust Genesis chapter 1, then how in the world can you trust anything else? Well, just so happens we trust Genesis 1. I trust the Bible. I trust that when it said God created everything out of nothing, that God created everything out of nothing. That when he said, let there be light, that poof, light became, it came into existence. That when God created the heavens and the earth, when he spoke those things into being, he spoke them into being. That's how it happened. It wasn't by some cosmic burp that happened four points, however, it keeps going up. As I get older, they keep making it longer because that's the magic formula. You add time and it makes it, makes it work. But, but God made it happen. He made it happen and he did it on purpose. He spoke everything into being. And you can look through Genesis chapter 1 and you can follow it. And you can say, well, God said and then God saw. God said and then God saw. And you go through the whole chapter, you find out that God's words are very powerful. And guess what? He created us the same. He has given us power to our words. That's why he tells us to be careful with our words. In Proverbs chapter uh, that we just read this morning, Proverbs 18, verse 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Why is that? Because we have been created in the image of the Father God. He's like, I'm going to make you in my image. Now, he made us in his image in multiple ways. But we'll get to that later. Um, i got to find out where I'm at. Bear with me just for a minute. So you were born for such a time as this. Uh, I trust the word of God is true. As a matter of fact, we've said it before. This is my Bible. I can have what it says I can have. We go through that whole thing. We believe that it is God's word and that it is inerrant. That is, there are no errors in that Bible. Okay, God, when God said that he did it, he did it. And it's not that hard to believe. Besides, he was there. He saw it happen. No matter what happens to you in this life, you should not be moved by, we should not be moved by our circumstances. Rather, we should speak life to those circumstances. We should look forward to the fulfill, fulfilling the will of God in our lives, no matter what the cost. I like Paul's example throughout the word or the New Testament. He was warned by others that if he went to Rome, it would lead to his death. He was warned by the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 20, verses 22 and 23, it says, And see, now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. Oh, that'll bless you. The Lord says, hey, I want you to go to Dazel, and I'm going to let you know that chains and tribulations await you. Be like, all right, praise the Lord. But at least you wouldn't be caught off guard, amen? You'd know that chains and tribulations await you if you went to Dazel. For those of you that don't know where Dazel is at, you go nowhere, turn left, you found it. No, I'm just kidding. It's just down the road. Um, so then, but, he, but I want you to look at his attitude as well. If you look at his attitude, his attitude in verse 24. But how much of this bothers him or moves him? You guys aren't reading it, are you? Let's look. At, I want to make sure I've got the right verse up there for right now. Okay, the second word, how much of it moves him? None of it moves him, right? None of these things move me. What else? Nor do I count, count my life dear to myself so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. None of those things moved him. Even though the Holy Spirit was saying, hey, Paul, when you go into the next town, chains and tribulations are going to wait you. That didn't move him. He was like, all right, let's go to the next town. I hope that our attitude is that way. I hope that my attitude is that way, that if the Lord calls me to go to a certain place and, and minister the gospel there, if he says, I'm going to tell you this, you're going to get thrown in prison and fined. Glory, let's go. Amen. Let's rock and roll. Let's go. Let's get this done. Because somebody needs to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Those chains are temporary. Even if they throw you in prison, he, he, Paul understood this. Even if they throw me in prison for the rest of my life, and even if they find me, tax me, do whatever they want to me, this is not the end. Are you with me so far? Because this life is not the end. This is just the beginning. This is our proving ground for eternity. This is kind of like the placement test, if you will. Where, what are we going to do with what we've been given determines where we're going to go and where, how we're going to spend it. When Paul was shipwrecked on the island of, of Malta, 
he was gathering together. By the way, he was, you got to understand, when he, by the time he got to Malta, the, he, they had fasted for 14 days. All right. They had been through a tempest that even the sailors were fearing for their own lives. The, the soldiers wanted to jump ship and run. And, but Paul's like, no, keep them all here on the ship. The ship struck ground, and it ended up getting broken apart, but they ended up swimming to shore, those that could swim. The rest of them grabbed something that could float, and they floated into shore. So they've already been through a shipwreck and fasting, and Paul's gathering sticks to make a fire. And as he's gathering sticks, a viper comes out and bites him on the hand. Wow, that'll bless you too, won't it? <laughs> Some of us be like, God, come on now. Just fasted 14 days. I've been shipwrecked, and now you're going to send a snake to bite me on the hand? Are you kidding me? No, but that wasn't his response at all, was it? What was Paul's response? Those of you, you, you know, he's just like, Phew. there you go. Shook it right off into the fire. Shook it off. Took care of it. Never once complained. And when the natives saw him get bit, they're like, oh, yeah, you got away from the shipwreck. you dead now. But that wasn't the case either. And then when they saw that he wasn't phased by this viper, they were like, he must, this, this guy's got it going on. And he ended up uh, helping to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ on the island of Malta. Paul wasn't moved by what man could do to him because he was going to Rome to be persecuted there as well. He didn't wear his Christianity on his predicaments. Paul was moved by what the Lord wanted him to do. Paul was going after what, what God wanted him to do. The Lord had told him, I need you to testify in Rome as well. Back to the, back to the Lord. The Bible tells us that God spoke everything into being. And again, through Genesis 1, we read, God said, let there be, and God saw that it was good. We also read in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. Now, I'm going to clarify this here. Jesus was not created. All right? Jesus always was, always is, and always will be. He was not a created being. He is equal with God, and he was in the beginning, and everything that was created was created through him. Isn't that cool? He saw the end from the beginning. He knew what was coming for his life here on earth, and he still chose to do this. All things were created by God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. When? In the beginning. You want to know where the beginning of everything is at? You can read the Bible and find out. In the beginning is when everything was created. Everything was created in the beginning. And God started the time clock for humanity when he made Adam and Eve. In the beginning. Everything that was created was created in the beginning. It didn't happen by accident. It wasn't a cosmic burp that happened 4.3 billion years ago. It was made by God. He had it all planned out when he spoke the first thing into being. And by the way, speaking of creation, a lot of you know this already, but the, the word universe you can split that into uni and verse. Uni means single and verse spoken sentence. Well, that makes sense, doesn't it? God said and God saw, right? God said, let there be, and it happened. Universe, a single spoken sentence. God took care of it. Um, notice in Genesis 126 that you and I are made in the image of God and his likeness. That puts us at the top of creation. We are made in the image of God. That puts us at the top of creation. Okay, not dogs or cats or trees or any other thing that people and man want to put out there. Human beings are at the top of creation. Humans are not the problem for this planet. Sin is. Are you with me? There's a lot of people that are pushing this out in the agenda that human beings are the problem. That's the whole goal of, like, the New World Order and different things. You can find it on the stones in Georgia that are erected over there that they want to decrease the population. There are some crazy thoughts out there by people who don't follow the Bible. And the reason they don't know is because they haven't studied the truth. They haven't looked into it to find out that the truth is God is the one who created us. He created this planet for us to dwell in and to use and to take care of. Not for us to be bound by the planet, but rather for us to take care of the planet. Are you with me so far? All right. So back to this. We see that Genesis in Genesis and throughout the Bible, we also see the power of the tongue. And by the way, humans are the ones that Jesus came to redeem. We're, he came to redeem us from the power of sin, and that is good news for us. He came to redeem us from, from sin, death, hell, and dandruff. I mean, I love the fact that Jesus came for us. Amen. One day we won't have to worry about dandruff. We get into heaven, and we'll have perfect scalps. Glory. And now everybody's like, oh, man. Oh. 
So we can see in Genesis and throughout the Bible the power of the tongue. The spoken word is a very powerful thing. With our words, we can build up, and with our words, we can destroy. Parents, choose your words wisely when speaking to your children because one day they will choose your nursing home. Children, choose your words wisely when speaking to your parents because they have the power to punish. And be thankful that we don't live underneath the Levitical law because some of us wouldn't be here today. <laughs> you younger, the youngers of you, now I'm not talking about little kids, but younger people, choose your words wisely when speaking to the elders. The Lord hears every word spoken. He is not deaf to our words. Matthew 12, 36 and 37 says, But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak. I want to read that again. For I say to you that every idle word men may speak. They will give account of it in the day of judgment. That should scare us right there. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. There is power in our words. Do you see this so far? The reason there's power in our words is that we have been created in the likeness of God. Now, that does not make us God, okay? Just because we've been created in his likeness, that doesn't mean that we are God. But we have been created in his image. And in that image comes the ability to speak death and life. We see that in Proverbs. We see it in the beginning. We see it all throughout. Because we've been created in the likeness of God, we must choose our words wisely. And it reminds me of the Indiana Jones movie when he was going after the Holy Grail. And he comes into that old knight. And that, that knight, what does he tell him? He says, you must choose. But choose what? Wisely. Okay, some of us have seen that movie. <laughs> Anyways, you must choose. You must choose wisely. And it's the same way with our words. When we speak our words, we've got to choose them wisely. Make sure that what we're speaking is life and not death. The fear of the Lord, by the way, is the beginning of wisdom. And if you're not sure what to say, you can ask yourself, would I say this if I were in the presence of God? So we can look at our words. Would I say this if I were standing, if, if God himself or Jesus were standing right there in front of me, would I choose these words? We must choose wisely. Understanding, by the way, if, if the fear of the Lord is beginning wisdom, understanding is to depart, depart from evil. I'll say that again. Understanding is to depart from evil. As we understand how powerful our words are, it makes the, our passage this morning come to life. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 20. A man's stomach shall be satisfied from the fruit of his mouth. From the produce of his lips, he shall be filled. If our mouths speak forth death, then what shall our innermost being be filled with? I heard a couple of responses, death, and that is correct. If our mouths speak forth death, then our innermost being is going to be filled with death, is it not? Well, then the opposite true, is it? If our mouths are filled with life, then guess what's going to come forth? Life. That is correct. Our stomachs are filled with the fruit of our mouths. And this is a truth that we will never get away with. We can't get away with this truth. I mean, it, we can't go away from it. It's true. And that begs the question then, what shall we speak? Well, that brings us to point number two. I'm glad you asked, what shall we speak? We are called to speak as he speaks. And the he should be capitalized up there. It is good. We are called to speak as he speaks. Mark 11, 22 through 24. So Jesus answered and said unto them, now, before we get to this, we need to understand what the context is here. The disciples were walking along one day, and Jesus went up to a fig tree, and the fig tree didn't have any figs on it, and Jesus did what? He cursed the fig tree. He said, Nobody, no man will eat fruit from you ever again. And the next day, as they're walking along, one of the disciples said, Look, Jesus, that tree, it's withered and dead. It's dead. And Jesus then says, Have faith in God. For assuredly, I say unto you, that whatsoever you, whosoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes those things which he says will be, will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say unto you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you will have them. Now, if you look in this, you can count them up. The Lord uses, the word said or says is, is in there six times. So when the Lord speaks, we ought to listen. Kind of like, you guys remember the E.F. Hutton commercials? Okay. When E.F. Hutton speaks, everybody listens. Well, I can tell you this. When the Lord speaks, even E.F. Hutton listens. Okay. When the Lord speaks, he believes what he says will come to pass. And he is teaching us to do the same. 
the reason that the Lord told them to speak to the mountain is because he had cursed the fig tree. And when the following day, again, when they passed by, that thing was dead. And he also warned us of idle words as well. Why? Because death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those that love it will eat the fruit thereof. We have an option to use our words for life or death. Words for life would be preaching the gospel. And again, we're relaunching Project 99 on Saturday, April 7th. And there's four different teams that we're looking for for those of you that helped to make this happen. First thing's a planning team. There are people in here that love to plan things. I know that. You love sitting down and figuring out how many houses can we possibly minister to or how many people can we possibly get to on a Saturday morning within one hour. You like filling in the little blocks and coloring the pictures in there, and that's awesome. We need you. There are others that like to walk and pray. We need you because how many know that there are principalities and powers over the houses around us? There are principalities and powers that need to be brought down to their knees and their powers need to be broken over homes in this area. We need you. There are those that you can't walk for and pray, but you can pray here. We need you because you can pray over those maps and pray over the different areas and, and, and cast down all those things that are in the way and hindering the gospel from being preached to those people. You can help to remove the blinders from people's eyes and unstop their ears, spiritually speaking, so that when the door-to-door -door team gets there, the work's been done. All they're doing there is they're just giving out the, 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 the information. And you've made and paved the way for them to get through. It's kind of like if you're on a safari and you're trying to get through a jungle, would you rather have a machete or, you know, maybe a dull butter knife? I'd rather have a machete. And that's what prayer does, is you can start whacking through all that stuff in there. Or better yet, it's kind of like having a tank and running through all that stuff. Because prayer is powerful. Those of you that were here last Sunday night, we watched the movie War Room. Wow, what a powerful movie on prayer and how, how effective prayer is. There's a lot of truth packed in that. And we see it throughout the Word of God. You see, Jesus himself, he took the time to pray, and he's the Son of God. And if he took the time to pray, how much more should we take the time to pray? So we've got, a, we've got a planning team. We've got the prayer team, which is actually broken up in two, those that want to walk through the neighborhood and those that want to stay and pray. And then we've got the door-to-door -door team. Those of you like me that like to talk to people and you don't mind knocking on doors, we, this is the place for you. Because we're going to be knocking on those doors saying, hey, I'm so-and-so from First Assembly of God. We want to invite you to church on Sunday morning. Is there anything we could pray with you about? And that should open up the door right there. And if they say no and slam the door in your face, you go to the next one and pray for those people. Amen? Look at what Paul went through. If the worst thing that's going to happen to us is if somebody slams the door in our face, whoa, that's not bad at all. They didn't whip our backs with rods and didn't beat us and, and lock us up in stocks, but we can minister to our neighbors. And I'm going to tell you this right now. Satan is hating that I'm telling this to you. He is hating at everyone. He, he's hating that we're even going to do this. Why? Because there's going to be people that are going to get set free. Their eyes are going to be open to the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they're going to get saved and delivered, and then they, too, are going to go in turn and go out and minister the gospel to other people. But it's not going to happen if we don't do it. The fourth team is the data team. There are people in here who love to crunch numbers and, and put stuff into my, my wife is one of those. She loves doing data entry. Data entry. If you're, that's your cup of tea, by all means, we could put you to work there as well. So there's four things that are coming here shortly. Be praying over what the Lord would have you to do. Be praying over what God would have you to do. Six months is what I'm looking for. To try, we're going to do this for six months, and we're going to see the results. I believe God has got some big things happening for us this year. I'm, I'm excited about it. So I want to encourage you to be praying for our neighbors. There are parents out there that have been praying for their kids that live in the neighborhoods all around us. There are grandparents that have been praying for their kids for, in the neighborhoods all around us. And they may live in another state, but you are the answer to their prayers. We are the answer to their prayers. The question is, are we going to put legs to our faith? Are we going to put feet to our faith? Are we going to walk out there? What does the Bible say about those who preach the gospel? What does it say about their feet? They're beautiful. You got some good-looking feet when you go out there and preach that gospel. The Lord's like, oh, yeah, them purdy. That's the southern for Those are beautiful feet. We are the ones that will be ministering to those kids, those sons and daughters and those grandkids pray for their hearts to be open to the gospel for their blinders to be removed pray that the captives be set free don't wait to tell them the gospel if the opportunity presents itself by all means share the gospel of jesus christ with them our words can be used to encourage the saints as well not only the sinners but the saints we can encourage one another in the lord 
Listen, if someone is believing God for a big miracle and your faith isn't there, don't say anything negative. Don't bring them down, but rather just encourage them. Don't sow seeds of doubt and unbelief by speaking words of death. Rather, rejoice with them. Seek the Father and dive into the Word. Get that grain of faith and let it grow. So if you, can't, if you aren't on their level of believing, don't just be quiet. Don't speak any death or, or in, into that situation, but rather just encourage them and, and say, you know what, I'll be praying with you. I'll be praying with you. Get that grain of faith and let it grow. Now, I'm going to say this. There's going to be times that we'll need to speak death. <gasps> what? Yep. There's going to be times that we need to speak death. Why? Because we have a real enemy, and he is the devil. The devil is not a made-up or imaginary figure. He is a real being who hates you. He has a terrible plan for your life, and that is to steal, kill, and destroy. Okay? God has a wonderful plan. The devil has a terrible plan. And, and the devil is a real enemy. He fights you on a daily basis. And I'm going to tell you this. As we grow closer to this date of launch, the, I, I promise you this. If you're serious about this, the attacks will increase. Glory to God. Why are they going to increase? Because the enemy doesn't want anybody else getting set free. He'd rather us just be content where we're at, sit in our pews or chairs, and not do a single thing. Come to church, raise your hands during worship, go home. That's what he wants. I don't want that, do you? Good. I'm glad to hear some no's out there. Praise the Lord. I'd rather kick him in the teeth and get things done for the kingdom of God because we've only got a short time left before the King of kings and Lord of lords returns. We've got only a short time left in this, even if I live to be 120 years old, praise the Lord. Even if I live to be that long, it's still nothing compared to eternity. It's a... <laughs> the Bible says our life is but a vapor. Here's a vapor in sound terms. Those of you listening by CD. <laughs> it's just a little... P we got to do what we can do while we're still here. Because once we get into heaven, we won't be leading people to Christ. We'll be worshiping at his feet. So we have times we'll need to speak words of death. And because we have a real enemy, his plans are real simple. I just told you that Satan wants to steal, kill, and destroy. That's found in John 10.10. 10. But I want you to know this, that he has plans. As born-again, blood-bought, power-filled believers, you have the authority to speak death to his plans. Amen? Call the plans of the enemy to die and be destroyed in the name of Jesus. Close any doors that you have gained, given him access to in your life, that you have given him entrance to into your life. Close those doors and speak death to his plans. Trust the Lord God and then speak death to the plans of the enemy. Curse cancer, sickness, disease. Look forward to the healing that is provided through Jesus Christ, our King of kings and Lord of lords. You know, if the Lord gives you a promise, then instead of saying if, rejoice because when is on the way. Amen? I love it when when is on the way. When we pray, believe that we've received them and we shall have them. Those are the instructions from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God bless you. How do we do this? How do we receive these things ahead of time? I'll give you an example. I like this example. How many of you have ever gotten money back at the end of the year from your taxes? Yes, all right. We love it when that happens, don't we? Okay, when we fill out our tax form and you've paid your little fee to, to send it off or whatever, if you've got somebody that prepares it, and you find out you're getting some money back, the inside of you starts doing the happy dance, doesn't it? Oh, yeah, I'm getting some money back, some money back. That's the way we should be when the Lord gives us a promise. The Lord's given me a promise, and I'm going to claim it, and it's mine. Hallelujah. From the, I, I don't see it yet, but it's there. It's mine. We see it on the inside. Some of us get into the money back tax dance. Most of us are already spending that money, aren't we? <laughs> I'm going to do this, this, and this. Or well, we're making a list of pill bills to pay off, not pills, but bills. Or There's a few of us that set it aside for a rainy day. Believing that you've received that tax money has our hearts lifted in anticipation of that auto deposit. We don't walk around wondering if. We walk around saying, oh, yeah, when is on its way. So if we do that with our taxes, why on earth... <laughs> do we treat the Lord in such an opposite manner? It's sin to walk around wondering if God heard us to pray, heard us pray. How do you know that? 
because sin or because so, doubt and unbelief is sin. It's sin for a born again believer to speak fear, doubt, and unbelief. Let me tell you something. God is a whole lot bigger than a tax return. He's a, he's a gazillion times bigger. I don't know if that's a real word. He's a Googleplex bigger. He's just huge, much bigger than a tax return. He can take care of our needs. He's a healer when we are sick. Amen. We find that in the Word of God. He's our provider when we are in need. He's our redeemer when we are helpless. He's our counselor when we are confused. He's our comfort when we are distressed. And he's our shield when the enemy surrounds us. We have an awesome Savior. When we pray with our mouths, there is power in our prayers. When we believe that those things we petition the Father will come to pass. So speak life into the situations that look like death. If you can't speak life, then don't say anything at all. And this brings us to our last point this morning. Tame that tongue. Tame that tongue. That reminds me of the saying. You guys remember the show um, where they'd build the houses for people? Ty Pennington, I believe is the guy's name. What was the name of that show? Home, extreme Home Makeover, yeah. And at the end of the show, what would they tell the bus driver? Bus driver, move that bus, right? That just reminded me of this. Well, this is kind of like Jesus telling us, son, daughter, tame that tongue. A mouthful of peanut butter is a quiet mouth. It is. And again, if you're allergic to peanut butter, then shove that thing full of, of chubby bunny marshmallows. Get the big ones there. Chubby bunny. If you can't speak faith, don't speak at all. Instead of speaking death, just be quiet. Proverbs 18, 21 again. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those that love it will eat its fruit. Fruit. If you have to literally... Go and place a tablespoon of peanut butter in your mouth to train yourself not to speak fear, doubt, and unbelief, then do it. You have a responsibility as a believer to speak words of life. I have a responsibility as a believer to speak words of life. Times of quietness before the Lord are enjoyable times. And we find this example with Mary and Martha in Luke chapter 10. Martha was... And Listen, I know we hammer on Martha sometimes in this passage. Granted, there was things that needed to be done. The meal needed to be cooked. The house needed to be clean. I'm sure that the pots of water and the jars of water that they washed the people's feet with needed to be filled. But Mary took the other route. What did she do? She sat down at the feet of Jesus and listened to his words. Martha got upset. What did Jesus tell her? Martha, Martha, you're worried about all these things, but Mary has chosen the better, right? Sometimes we just need to sit down and listen at the feet of the master. Mary chose the good part, which would not be taken away from her, and she enjoyed the presence of the Lord. A mouthful of peanut butter is a nutritious mouth. You can feed the body and spirit. We take time to close our mouths and study the word. Take time to sit down at the feet of Jesus through personal study of the word of God through teaching CDs, through video series. Recharge your faith by listening to the word through preaching. There's different things we can do to sit back and take it in. Now, once we've taken it in, we need to expend that energy. It's kind of like a pond. If you have a pond and it just takes in water only and doesn't do anything else, what happens to that pond? It becomes stagnant. And then it starts to get nasty and stinky and it's mosquitoes. You know, the South Carolina State bird moves in. Um, you know, we, but if that pond is moving, if the, you have entrance of water and water leaving, it brings life. God bless you, too. It brings life, and, and it regenerates health into that pond. And it's the same way as us as believers. We can take, 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 but if we're not doing something with that, then guess what starts to happen to our spiritual life? It starts to become stagnant. So if we aren't ministering out, we need to minister out sometime. Twice. God bless you. Come on, one more time. That reminds me of a story. I'll tell you it later. later. But Martha enjoyed the, the presence of the Lord. So take some time to sit down before the Lord. As, as Bruce comes this morning, I want to tell you something. Somebody once said that the first time you quote somebody, you quote them with their name. The second time you say something like someone once said. And the third time you use it, you say, I, I've, like I've always said. So like I've always said, preparation days are never wasted days. <laughs> All right, I'll give credit where credit's due. That was from Clyde Oliver. For preparation days are never wasted days. 
so we can prepare now to speak and live by faith. Don't wait until bad situations come because we've already been promised that as believers, those things are coming. <laughs> that'll, that'll make you happy, won't it? Bless the Lord. Bad things are coming my way. <laughs> But don't wait until those times comes to start digging into the word, but rather fill yourself now so that when those times do come, you have something to draw on and take, take out of. Are you with me so far? Do those things. Don't wait until the bad situations come, but to start living by faith. Start small and believe God for the little things that you need. I'll never forget the story my father-in-law told. And he just, it wasn't long after he became become a Christian. And he's like, Lord, he was going to Walmart. Yeah, that place. He said, Lord, I really would like a front parking space. And you know what happened is he was driving up, a car backed out, and he pulled right into a front parking space. It was just a little a, a thing of faith for him, and something small that he started with, and from there it grew. We can do those things. Our, listen, our tithe is another area that the Lord tells us to test him in. As believers, we should be tithing. That's, that's a, that's a um, oh, let me, how do, how do I put this? non-negotiable with the Lord. As believers, we're called to tithe and give up the, the first 10%, the first of our first fruits, into, the, into the, the back end of the ministry. And that would go to the local church here where you get fed at. Amen? So, and, and it's something that the Lord says, test me in this. See if I will not open up the windows of heaven. That is a big thing. You know, when God opens up a window, it's not a little tiny Barbie doll house type thing. He opens up a window. He opens up a window. And when he pours out blessings, he pours out blessings. So we can live in the blessings of the Lord, or we can live underneath his curse. If we don't tithe, then we start falling underneath the curse. It's found in the Bible. It's from the, New, or from the Old Testament all the way through the New. But it's one area that the Lord tells us, test me in this and see if I won't do this. And we're blessed as we do so. But we can also start small in our faith and take small steps of faith and gradually build that up. There's nothing wrong with that. Start small and build it up. Daily start and speak and believe him for things. Believe him for his will to be accomplished. Believe for a divine appointments to minister the gospel. Believe for boldness to speak his word. Believe for wisdom. Believe that you have been set free. If you're dealing with something and you need freedom, believe that he has set you free. Why? Because the Bible tells us that he who the Son sets free is free indeed. And you can walk in that freedom. I can walk in that freedom. We can believe him for that. The word tells us, ask and you shall receive so that your joy will be made full. If there's something that you need in your life and, and you present it to the Lord, go before him, petition him because he is a good father. He's not going to give you a scorpion or a snake in return, but rather he blesses those that come before him and ask him out of a pure heart. Coach your tongue when needed. Stack that thing full of peanut butter if you need to. You're created in his image. Speak life and then receive. Would you stand with me this morning? I got a question. How have your words been? Have they been pleasing to the Lord and full of faith and life? Or have they been full of death, doubt, and unbelief? Do the words come out of your mouth? Well, that just scared me to death. This is killing me. This is bad. I'm going down. Or do you speak life into those situations? Have you decided to live by faith, or do your circumstances dictate what you say and how you act? Have you been living for the Lord or yourself? This is something we need to ask ourselves daily. Am I living for you, Lord, or am I living for myself? Where am I at? Are you speaking words of life to your neighbor or sharp words? The altar is open this morning. I'd like for you... If whether you need to talk to him about your words of faith or fear, doubt, and unbelief or whatever, the altars are open. And the Lord is willing to meet us here this morning at this place. Whether you need to repent of speaking fear, doubt, and unbelief, or you just want to come and choose to live by faith, or maybe, maybe you don't know Jesus as Savior yet. We want to give you that opportunity here this morning to come and meet the King of kings and Lord of lords, the one who can set you free and give you life for eternity. As Bruce leads us in a song, the altars are open. I will so up, I'll be up here to pray for those of you that may, may need healing in your body as well. I'd be more than happy to pray with you on that too. Because we serve the living God and our healer, our provider, our maker. As Bruce leads us in a song, would you come? Let me go. I lay it all down again to hear you say.
day that I'm mine. You are my desire. No one else will. Nothing else could take your place to the warmth of your breath. Help me find a way and bring me back to you. Oh, you're Let me go. I lay it all down again to hear you say that I'm take your place to feel the warmth of your Let's go before the Lord one more time this morning. Father, we thank you. We love you and praise you. And I ask that your presence would go with us from this place this morning. That if we were speaking words of doubt or sharp words towards our neighbor, that you would convict us, that you would quicken us right there so we could repent and, and may words of life flow through us. May words of healing flow through us. Words that give encouragement flow through us. Use us for your glory. We submit to you today. Father, we pray for our neighbors that need Jesus Christ, that you would use us to minister to them, that their blinders would be removed, that their ears would be unstopped, that their hearts would be prepared to receive Jesus as Savior and Lord. We love you and praise you, Father. I pray for those in this place this morning that need a touch from you, that today would be the day that they would receive every need according to your riches and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for coming this morning. You are dismissed. We'll see you tonight in small groups at 6 o'clock.